Hey everyone, and welcome to the Building Geniuses podcast, where we talk to geniuses throughout the commercial real estate and building automation industries, asking them how they've gotten where they are, who's walked alongside them, and how they're helping others along the way. This is episode two of season two, and I am your host, Tim Vogel. In this episode, we're speaking with John Petsy of Sky Foundry, at least of Sky Foundry at the time of recording this, by the time it releases. Well, we'll talk about that here a little bit more. But hey, John, welcome to the Building Geniuses podcast. Hey, thanks a lot, Tim. Pleasure to be here. Happy to uh, contribute to your podcast series here. Yeah, uh, I'm very, very excited about this. So, uh, John, you and I have, uh, you know, honestly had very little interaction with each other. I think I've seen you at every trade show. I've seen you speak on countless, you know, uh, either virtual events or, or in-person events. And uh, But I've always you know, admired you. You're kind of like a, a giant or a titan of the industry. You know, everyone knows John. Um, and then what? something happened yesterday. Uh, so, you know, this is a Tuesday, and yesterday was a Monday. And on Mondays, or at least once a month, there's this show called Monday Live, of mm-hmm. which you are a major part of. And... Uh, on Monday Live, what happened was you were outed, at least in the sense of John's retiring and we're going to embarrass him. And it was <laughs> awesome. And it was not expected uh, no. from, er, by you at all. Uh, yeah. But one thing that absolutely stood out is how loved and respected and appreciated you are. And I, you were already on my short list for the season two. And I was like, I absolutely have to speak with him <laughs> before he retires and, and, and get this. And so uh, all that to say, I'm a little jealous that I haven't gotten to work with you. Uh, but I am so, I feel so fortunate to be able to at least have this opportunity. So thank you again for coming on. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been spending your time on these last few years? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I think one of the things that's that's led to so many experiences in the industry is getting involved in the very early days of uh, m- applying microprocessors to control buildings. Right. Over the years, it's had numerous names. It was called energy management systems back then, and direct digital control, and building automation, building management systems, intelligent buildings, on and on and on. We're still doing the same thing. The tools are better. Right. Um, we're trying to operate the systems that make uh, human life in the built environment possible and trying to do it well, trying to do it efficiently, and trying to do it reliably, right? And um, I got involved very early on. I actually came into the industry from the manufacturing side, making HVAC equipment. I'm an industrial engineer by training. And I ended up with a company who um, made variable air volume products in fact, they, uh, uh, the owner was the inventor of the VAV valve. He held the first patent on it. Uh, the company's called Mitko, a gentleman by the name of Demita Gorchev. And uh, I was a production uh, operations engineer, operations manager, um, and uh, let's make this stuff, let's make it right, let's make it efficiently, and let's make sure it works. Uh, and that's where I really get exposed to, you know, the details of HVAC systems, how do you size them, design them, uh, and those concepts, right? I mean, and I think that's one of the things about our industry, you, you know, there are so many facets of technology and engineering that go into buildings that I think this has been one of the barriers. So how do you get new people in? How do they get experience? Right? You can't go take a course and learn this. It is, I've said before, it's a practice like medical, right? Because there are so many different systems. So that was when I get exposed to, you know, the design and operation of HVAC systems. Very little about controls, in fact, right? The main controls we had were pneumatic um controllers you know receiver controllers operating the vav valves uh operating the um variable vanes on axial fans or the uh or causing a relay to trip to do a two-speed fan and stuff like that but that's where i got started and then i had the uh good fortune to get a job in the very early days of andover controls when they were introducing microprocessor based uh energy management systems and I, was, I ended up being the very first application engineer at Andover Controls. Um, I remember very well that they said, the engineers are still answering the phone and they don't want to. 
And so we're going to give you a desk and a phone, you know, one of those brown plastic phones and a yellow pad of paper and a pencil. And now you'll answer the calls. And uh, some people probably heard this, but they said, you know, we know you don't know anything. That's okay. You can come to us and we'll give you the answer. And then they sternly said, one time. <laughs> in other yeah. words, write this down and learn it because, you know, we'll help you, but you're the one taking over our tech support. So yeah. what an experience, right? Because it was the early days of an industry, early days of a technology. And, you know, if in general, nobody knew how you were going to solve all these problems, right? Yeah. How are you going to throw a light switch? Fine. How are you going to control the veins on a chiller? Well, you've got a digital computer and you got to convert to an analog signal and we're going to connect to this and the safety's involved. People are learning all of this stuff, right? Um, because it held so much promise for the precision and reliability that you'd be able to control versus uh, right. pneumatics. Right? So that was step one into the controls industry. And uh, I answered 10,000 um, tech support calls. And back then it was all calls. There were no, there weren't even faxes right. coming in, right? And um, yeah. you handled it like it did in uh, lab work in college. We had a lab notebook, and every single call had to be written in the lab notebook. Mm -hmm. That's how you did it, wow. right? And how long did you do that? I mean, t ten thousand cases. I mean, how? Uh, yeah, how how long did it take you to do that? <laughs> well, I was in Android for controls through three employment cycles. I was there. Uh, and left to one of their dealers. Remember that was the term we used to use and uh, went out in the field. And so now I'm out in the field with a you know, mechanical contracting company and we're installing these things and wiring up and taking care of the customers, the whole other side of the business, right? And wow, what a different phase of learning. Great, you know the product, but now you got to deal with how does it, what does it take to put it in a building and operate the building and all of the crazy stuff you run into. Anyways, I, I did that. Then I went back to Andover um, and then I, I left again and actually went and uh, took the helm of a startup uh, building automation company, Teletrol Systems, and uh, became a competitor. And uh, from there, we had to create a product on, you know, hardware engineer, design it and software engineers to do the firmware and the software and bring yeah. it to market and set up support and set up training and set up distribution, so all of these different facets that it takes to get uh, controls technology into buildings to run those buildings right. And I, I've yeah. always said, I think one of the challenges our industry faces is that the average people who occupy buildings, they don't really know what goes on behind the walls and ceilings of the building that make the building habitable. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that lack of appreciation leads to a lot of the challenges we face in um, showing owners the value of running their buildings properly, of implementing these intelligent systems, because it's, you know, it's just like I walked in my office, the lights are on, the temperature's comfortable. Isn't that like how it's how things work? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they do yeah. when, they're, when they're right, you know. Yeah. Um, so, and then, um, well, but how, how did you get the opportunity at Teletrol? Uh, well, that, that really, you know, you, you did send some topics ahead of time. One of them was about, you know, how do you contribute back? And I've been, a, was an early member of AEE, um, Association of Energy Engineers. And, you know, they used to have, you know, back when we could all meet in person, you know, regional meetings, monthly regional meetings of branch of the different offices, um, and, or branches. And um, they called on people in the industry to come down and talk. Uh, and the whole point was non-commercial. You know, you're not there to sell your product. You're there to That's talk right. about a facet right. of what we're doing in the industry. And um, there was somebody in the audience. Um, I didn't know it. And then uh, a couple of days later, I got a phone call and uh, said, hey, we're, we got a company, a little company up here. We're doing some really cool stuff. You ought to come up and take a look. And I, I could read between the lines. And I'm thinking, well, I'm pretty happy to end over. All right, I'll take a ride, you know. And I went and yep. I walked in on a um, a very famous uh, gentleman, Dean Kamen, the inventor of the Segway and many other technologies, mm. um, one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. And uh, he invites me into his office. He's sitting on the floor, 
And I'm in the chair, and you know all these stories about how you gain power and stuff, right? They give you a shorter chair, and the, and he's on the floor. And he yeah. says, hey, I got this core of this company out here to control buildings. I hear you know about that. He goes, I have the best medical equipment in the world. I got the best helicopters in the world. I want to have the best energy management system in the world. Can you do that? And, you know, I'm 33, and I said, absolutely. Yeah, I know duh. more than anybody else I work with. <laughs> I can make a better system. You're going to let me do that? And, uh, and it all happened from speaking at an AE meeting, um, getting noticed, and somebody giving me an opportunity, really. That's, that's the main thing, just an opportunity. Um, and, you know, in the whole, you know, what's that? Chinese proverb, you know, what's the definition of luck, opportunity meeting preparation or something like that. And, you know, it did. I spent a bunch of time in the industry and seen systems be developed and seen, you know, great things and shortcomings. And I thought, hey, I really, you know, thought I could do this. And, you know, we built a successful company. Teletrol Systems was a successful company, sold systems around the world and had some really pioneering technology back in the uh, late 80s through uh, mid 90s. And then what happened to Teletrol? Well, I left to go um, do another startup. Um, so, you know, I left. The company kept going. Um, I was getting really interested in the um, lawn technology, echelon technology. And uh, a Teletrol dealer was very interested and said, hey, let's let's try to start something up around LawnWorks technology. And so... Was an it you know it was an interesting time in our our life and we said okay let's make a change after eight years and we moved uh, from New Hampshire to Atlanta and started a company called um, Solutions Direct Facility Robotics Solutions Direct it was the first first authorized Echelon distributor in North America and uh, we created a distribution company to collect all these widgets you know with the Echelon chip you could build a smart widget. But that's what everybody was doing. There were all these bits and pieces. There was nobody at that time who had like a system. And so there was an opportunity um, for a distribution uh, company and that's what we set up. But Teletrol continued on and finally got acquired um, by Philips and then merged with Automatrix and Cylon. And uh, I think ABB is an investor now. And so, you know, it continued on through numerous um, generations of technology and stuff but we had some very cool stuff back in the uh, very early open systems oriented technology so, yeah wow uh, it's always a big believer in in open open systems and mm -hmm. uh, so we, we pioneered some you know major open systems technology there so anyways went so, off to do a distribution company and uh, bring together lawnworks technology and then uh I guess this is maybe a side note, but what's your kind of elevator pitch for open systems? Yeah, that that's good. You know, um, I think one, one side of it is, you know, kind of an undeniable fact that the world had by then and continues today moved beyond the point where you could get everything you needed from any one manufacturer, mm -hmm. right? But it, you can think back to in the you know pneumatic days, you could get every bit of controls you needed from a Honeywell Johnson, you know, Robert Char, whatever, right? Right. But with digital technology, that changed. And so if you're there to serve the building owner, your systems have to be able to work with other devices, right, mm -hmm. from other manufacturers. And I don't know, it just made logical sense to me and maybe, you know, engineering background versus uh business background, the idea of, well, I'm, I'm going to succeed by trapping you with, so you can only work with my technology. It didn't make sense to me. Um, what made sense to me was, you know, we should be able to interoperate and, uh, you know, integrate different systems and combine them and deliver, you know, an, an, the end result. And if you do a good job at that, well, then, you know, your future is going to be assured too. So, um, I guess that would be my view of open systems. We used an open programming language back at Teletrol. We developed, mm -hmm. if not the first, one of the first an open uh, communications port. You could actually write drivers to talk to other systems. So we didn't control that. Our dealers, system integrators, could write connectors to other systems. Gave them the power to do what they needed for their customers. Yeah, that's what I always say too. It's, you know, an open system allows you to create and orchestrate the exact solution that an end user needs and wants. Yeah. 
Why, yeah. why not win by doing that the best for them, you know? So That's right. Yeah. Which then uh, necessitates increased collaboration, working together, having conversations, multiple vendors on a call, not competing, but rather working together yeah. again for right. a united front. Yeah, yeah. we've with the work that we do in the smart buildings, we've been able to have a lot of conversations and a lot of projects like that that have gone very well, which is only continue to reinforce uh, my perception and, and my commitment then to open systems, uh, whatever that looks like at whichever level you want to talk about. It's changed over time from the field bus protocols that led to, you know, BACnet, uh, LawnWorks, um, to the higher level integration of software applications via, you know, APIs uh, and web services. But the point is that you have to be able to connect these different systems together to get to an end result. Things, you know, how buildings are used and what needs to be done changes a lot, right? We can't yeah. lock yeah. people. It demands in. that interoperability. Yeah. It demands it. Yeah. So uh, you have this lawn works company. Yeah, how long? How long were you doing that, and and what came after that? We we went at that for just about two years, but um, it didn't. You know, we that one didn't succeed, if you will. You know, obviously, end <laughs> controls became very successful. I only had a small role in that. Uh, Teletrol became very successful. Had a had a big role in that. We didn't make it with the uh, distribution company. I ended up going back to Andover Controls. Got hired in there to actually run the third side of business. Okay, so I. But on the product side, product training, tech support, went out into the field. And then the other side was factory offices, systems groups, right? And so I, when I went back there, I ended up running one of their, uh, well, I ended up running all three of their systems groups, their local Boston office, their pharmaceutical specialty group, and then their um, global uh, customer system integration group. Um, so again, got exposed to other facets of you know this industry and what it takes mm -hmm. to implement systems yeah well john do you think you would have been ready for that third stint at andover controls without the 10 years at teletrol and and, and doing lawn works i don't know I, you know in a way because i met a lot of people who are certainly more experienced in running a systems integration business and they had come up through that if you will that one um path Right. Mm -hmm. And they knew more more than me. Right. Um, I certainly wasn't, you know, the best leader of a systems integration group that ever, you know. Um, so I don't know. I think what it did, though, is it gave me other viewpoints and insights into things. So I might have thought differently about how to solve some of the problems than the people who had just grown up, you know, through the contracting only side, hadn't had the product development and all of that and the tech support and hadn't been out in the field with an independent, right? Which is different than a factory owned office. So I think it just gave me more perspective, but yeah, they, you know, there are a lot of great branch office uh, leaders out there, so. Mm -hmm. Were there any particular leaders or coworkers or, or, or people that kind of really helped encourage you? You know, anytime you hear, um, you know, someone going back to a company once, it's like, oh man, there must've been something there that, you know, like really like drew you back to them. Going back twice is like, okay, it must've really, you know, you know, now it's like, okay, three full stints, right? You know, so maybe tell us a little bit about what it was like at Andover or more specifically, maybe the people that drew you back. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is interesting. And uh, some people heard me say, you know, I'm tied for the record. There are three of us who are three time repeat offenders with Andover uh, controls. I think the first time it was OK. Now I'd been out in the field and the company Andover continued to grow. And what I had been doing there really with, you know, the phone and the desk and that had really grown beyond that. And there was a chance to really run a tech support operation. Right. And, and quite frankly, I also learned that I wasn't um, highly suited to be a contractor, right? Mm. Working for that mechanical contractor and that um, lifestyle, I'm more, I was more of a product guy, right? Mm -hmm. at, the, at those levels, right? And so it was attractive, the opportunity was attractive and there were people who remembered me and with, you know, growth and reorganization, you know, they 
reached out and said, hey, you know, please come back. You know, we can really take this to the next level now. Um, and I think it all, you know, relates to hopefully just always trying to do a good job, always trying to do what's right. And, you know, sometimes you get frustrated because it might not be appreciated, but it often gets remembered, I think, you know, mm -hmm. so... Um, yeah. The third time, you know, was different. Um, you know, the Lawnworks company didn't take off, but I had learned a, a lot about that. And that's when, you know, Echelon was uh, really trying to get manufacturers to adopt that technology. Um, so now I had learned, you know, there were proprietary systems, and then this BACnet, and then lawn, you know, multiple camps, right? Right. So I, you know, learned a bunch about that. Um, but it was really an opportunity. They were grow growing the if you will, the management team and and uh, had a, had an important role up there. And so I went and did it. And then after that, actually, um, I ended up um, also taking over the engineering um, operation at, at Andover and became VP of uh, product engineering, which really brought me back to more of the things that I loved the most and probably felt the most comfortable being involved in. You know, it's interesting you talking about fit, you know, and, and recognizing that. Uh, earlier, I was having a conversation with someone about a guy I used to work with who was really good at sales, loved sales, very personable. Everybody loved him. He went into a sales management position. He was very glad to have worked up to that position. And everyone thought he was doing a really great job. He was leading great meetings. His sales team respected him. And about nine months in, he went to his boss and he said, this just isn't for me. I mm -hmm. miss just doing sales. Mm -hmm. And they said, absolutely. And they were so happy to give him that position back. Not be, I mean, they were disappointed that, you know, he mm -hmm. wasn't going to be the leader anymore, but they were happy that he was going to go back and do what he was also very good at. Mm -hmm. But there is this awareness. And what I've seen in our industry, too, is that sort of system integrator boots on the ground versus manufacturer or technology supplier. And I think both kind of have tendencies to be interested what's it you know what it's like on the other side of the fence you know how how green the the grass is yeah and and people find their fits you know there's right. plenty of people that are maybe in the field that are like you know I really want to be on the product side and so they come to a manufacturer and they flourish or they come mm -hmm. to a manufacturer they just get extremely frustrated right <laughs> and they're like forget this I'm going back uh, and then and then vice versa so you know the the recog Living on yes. that other side provided so much more insight in, that yes. fed into how you should develop products, support products, training. You know, that mm -hmm. that's the real value. But, yeah, you got to feel comfortable. And I always, you know, I uh, I knew hey, I wasn't born to be a contractor. It's a it's a very yeah. different, um, challenging role. So, yeah, Um I don't think we, we didn't quite go back this far. So before we continue moving forward down your path, let's go back. You So you went to college. What were you educated in formally? Uh, industrial engineer. Okay, good. And then that's when you then plants went and, and Plants and how do you make stuff? How do you yeah. make stuff, right? You how know, do you from, make it? Yep. There's a blueprint. How are we going to ship a thousand of them, right? That's, uh, <laughs> yep. you know, that always fascinated me. I'm a mechanically inclined person, but you didn't ask it, but there's an intersection there with how I ended up in, in this field. And in college, I was, um, you know, I was a child of the Arab oil embargo, right? And, uh, you know, that, may, that had a huge impact. Um, you know, a lot more people have died during COVID, but it made a societal change. Well, if you were around when there was no gasoline, you could not right. get gas. The world changed, right? And it changed for me in two ways. One, obviously, you know, like everybody else, you're waiting in line, or you've got you can only get gas on an even day or an odd day, and you can only get five gallons or whatever, all that. But I was a motorhead with oh. a uh, high performance gas guzzling car, and I can't get gas from my car my hot rod. Now that made a real impact on me and oddly yeah. enough turned me into uh, having great interest in energy conservation. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. the f very first company uh, started, uh, me and a couple of friends, we launched a solar uh, company, residential um, um, active solar. This is before there was, you know, 
um, you know, photovoltaic, right? That was, that was in the lab. Um, there were water-based systems and there were air-based systems, and we designed and installed, designed our own and installed air-based systems and had a company called Alternate Energy Concepts. And we were still in college, and we thought, you know, we would launch this. And then, of course, we graduated and got real career offers, and we'd done a, a bit of that, and we all went our separate ways. But um, energy became imprinted on me. And so I was always just from that day on interested in it. And so then that led to, you know, I guess it was a little bit of a gravitational pull, even though I didn't know where I was going, I didn't know what energy management systems were or building out of it. There was kind of a gravitational pull in that direction because of this interest in energy efficiency. I want to be energy efficient everywhere possible so I'd have enough gasoline to pour into my 500 horsepower hot rod. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's that's a great story, and you know, just think about uh, all the ECMs that have been born out of out of the oil embargo. Uh, you know, yeah. interesting. So it's like you've always kind of been a bit of a leader and a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, in college, we it was a real company. We incorporated, yep. went through all of that. So yeah, yep. I had that streak. Um, you know, I, it's funny, somebody had asked me that once and, you know, someone else I knew professionally met in the neighborhood and go, yeah, I'd love to try that entrepreneurial thing. And, you know, what's, what's the trick with that? You know, you know, what, what, what you say he'd gone like the corporate track. Huh? Yeah. And I said, it's a genetic defect. Either you got it or you don't <laughs> because yeah. I couldn't yeah. do what you do. And I don't know, you might not be able to do what I do, right? You know, yeah. um, it's, I think people are just inclined one way or another. And uh, so I couldn't envision not doing those types of um, initiatives. You know, I was always drawn to like a mission. We got to go do this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. solve this, or we're going to make this a success. You know, yeah. so project, I, I mean, kind of in a way project oriented, a company's bigger than but it, it was very much project oriented and the college i went to wpi um they were extremely project oriented half of your grade was projects right so if you're doing a project you like you know you, you can learn a material and take a core, uh, test but this was like projects that would take a semester or longer and you like had to like actually finish them you know yes yeah <laughs> you yeah know? That, my, my undergrad and my graduate were very similar to that and i had 19 credit hours one semester and seven group projects that were semester long and yeah you know in the moment you absolutely hate it but then you look back and you're like man that is some of the best education you could have because it's working with people delegating tasks long-term time management and there's got to be a result at the end you know, one person can do it all. And it's actually how the world operates. The world doesn't operate on read a book, take a test. The right. world operates on take your knowledge and get something you don't have all the knowledge for done because you got to pull together people and technology and component. Mm -hmm. That's how the world runs. And, um, you know, so I really value that uh, part of the education because that's, that's what makes the world work. Projects. And you know what? The, the, there are tests along the way, much like in school. And yeah. along the way, that's sales pitches, relationship building, <laughs> and winning deals, and driving yeah. revenue so you can go mm -hmm. and sell you know, you know, those, those products. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's an interesting analogy. I think, I think there's a blog post in there somewhere, mm -hmm. maybe a book. I don't know. Um, okay, so now you're the third stint at Andover, VP of Product Engineering. Mm -hmm. Then what? <laughs> then I go to a trade show in The Hague, in the Netherlands, a uh, lawn work show, um, because we had at Andover one product line based on lawn. Most of it was still all proprietary. But we had one product mm -hmm. line and we went over there to take it. And, um, you know, over there for you know a few days, whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's a small trade show. What do you think? 20, 30 exhibitors, whatever, you know. And I meet these two guys in a booth and they are showing web-based interface to a control system. Hmm. And that company is Tritium. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very fascinating. Um, the idea that, you know, this 
browser in its think about early primitive days in 1996, seven, yeah, probably right, right around, um, it might have been 98. Anyways, back then, it's for it's early days, right? Um, <laughs> that's how you interact with a control system. I have to go look at, at documents to yeah. get the exact data, <laughs> anyways, but it's there, right? And um, made an impression, spent some time talking to him, went back, went back to work in Hanover Controls. Months go by, and I get this phone call out of the blue. Hey, you remember me? Yeah, 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 yeah. We get this really interesting company down here. How'd you like to come and join us? And that was Jerry Frank at, at Tritium. And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. And, you know, Andover was now a, kind of a big company, right? Yeah. And uh, this sounded interesting, and I went down and talked to him, and so I accepted an offer to completely uproot life and move from Massachusetts down to Richmond, Virginia, and join um, Tritium. They were about 30 people at the time mm. in 2000, and uh, that started, you know, an amazing phase of uh, life and career with the launch of this. Um, completely new approach, right, to yeah. automation. One, one open interoperable, connect to what you got, right? It wasn't actually a controller, it had no IO, it was a software platform to do control, but it had to connect to other things. It was all IP based, it was all web based, the next generation of open, if you will. Um, and uh, went down and, and joined them. And, uh, you know, we had a have a business card. And so, you know, small company wearing a lot of hats. And so my business card was VP of operations and business development. Yep. Okay. <laughs> now think about that for a second. And people would look at it and, well, that's a different title. And I said, yeah, well, here's how it works. In the morning, my job is to control chaos and make things run right. And in the afternoon, I'm supposed to go create chaos. <laughs> Create chaos, yes. Yeah, your book, you book into your day. Yeah, out selling and trying to for, for promote this new technology and getting into projects that you know might be risky or whatever. And then tomorrow morning you got to put uh, order back to all of that. Um, so I played both sides again, and the, you know that was needed. But that was like this, yeah. I don't know, rare opportunity to use what I, the sales or person, you know, interpersonal skills and technology and and then just project management right we had to implement mm -hmm. networks and remote offices we set up a subsidiary in europe we set up a subsidiary in the far east everybody had to have a laptop when they came to work and networking and an erp and all that stuff that really wasn't controls related you know what it was projects right mm -hmm. and uh so spent time there and then you know over time, ended up uh, taking the CEO role, and the founder uh, stepped back to the CTO role and was there through um, the scale up and you know market impact of uh, Tritium um, up through uh, you know 2006. Yeah, wow, and you know I can only imagine that uh, you know that that must have been a very dynamic time uh, of amazing. change and. I mean, uh, the uh, the world was changing. That was uh, it was right around the time of the dot com boost. It sounds like it you was. win it or two thousand. I went there. In, I went there in two thousand. The dot com yeah. boom and then the dot com bust, which we bust. you know there were there were other companies um, going down that same road. Almost yeah. none of them made it through the dot com bust, but we we right. did by uh, a lot of hard work. And a lot mm -hmm. of good fortune too. We made it through, and you know, Tritium Niagara has had a huge impact. And uh, that's where I started to work with not only Jerry Frank, who brought me in, the founder, but his son Brian Frank. And of course, we've been working together ever since then, except for one short, a uh, couple of short periods of time. And uh, of course, we you know launched Sky Foundry in uh, in twenty, well, brought it to market in twenty ten, but formed it in two thousand nine. Yeah. Oh, you know, and I, I always try to think of cultural contexts, you know, when you have these conversations, you know, the dot com and technology, and then you had 9-11 shortly after that, the pending war, and then the war that started, 
you know, all of that's taking place while you're trying to then also upset, you know, the industry. Again, yeah. very kind of dynamic, you know, dynamic time wrong. there. We had an exciting story to tell. So, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I'm no, no, no. We had an exciting story yeah. to tell about a really new approach that solved a lot of problems. You know, one of the key things yeah. was, you know, we had a completely greenfield developed Lawnworks network management interface in the product. There were very few software packages, I think only other, one other than the one developed by Echelon to do Lawnworks man. And we had backnet support. And this was something I'll never forget. We used to go out and we said, yeah, so we have backnet. And they go, oh, good. So you're against that Lawnworks stuff. And I <laughs> right. said, I, I didn't say that, right? And I go to another meeting, yeah, we have complete lawn. Oh, so good, you're against that backnet. No. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it gets at one of the chal another challenge of our industry that uh, the tribal camp situation. Yes. You know, everybody calls it the protocol wars and stuff. It didn't help anybody, but there was, um, I think, a mindset still people were clinging to that one thing could become dominant. I think that hopefully is pretty much over now. There's not going to be one protocol. There's not going to be one software package. There isn't going to be one anything, right? Yeah. There isn't in our world and there isn't going to be in our industry, right? So yeah. let's just get over that and deliver good solutions, you know? Right. And even if there is, it's going to be short lived because something else will come along. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Hmm. And that's, you know, that's innovation. That's bringing new product, new that technology, yeah. new ideas. And yeah. And then, you know, I mean, even, uh, even technology changes and needs change and expectations change and, and some things just simply can't keep up and that's okay. Yep. Some if, things if we if we if we stuck there, then we, you know we'd still be on dial up. <laughs> <laughs> so glad glad that's over. All right. So 2006 uh, comes. Your time at Tritium ends. What's after that? Again, somebody I'd met along the way came knocking on the door and said, "Hey, we got this startup company who's ready to go to market." And uh, somebody said, "You'd be a really good guy to do it." And now, you know, Tritium's owned by Honeywell now. And uh, I've spent some, you know, a little bit of time in that. And I, you know, run up against the challenge I have dealing with big corporate environments. How's that for politically correct? Um, yeah, sounds good. And um, so it sounds very compelling. And I go to um, a company who's making biometric security technology and um, something I know nothing about, but it's building related technology and it's a project and it's got to go to market and you need distribution and you need support and you got to build the whole operation because basically we had a product on a bench in a lab by the engineers so it was like you know yeah. take this take this to a be, be a company and that was called Perverus. they had really advanced uh, unique biometric um, uh, um, identity verification technology and um, made a lot of sense to me and uh so moved again um not so far this time up to where i live now in charlottesville virginia to take over this company it had been started by a professor uh it wasn't technically a spin out of the um, university of virginia but it started and uh did that and um found another thing that didn't make it through um i actually credit that one that it was ahead of its time um yeah. with and uh it required people to change how they went about their daily life authenticating to the security system at the front door. So, for example, it would run a card access system. We had uh -huh. integrated with HID technology for, you know, it worked like a card. But then it, when you got to your computer, it allowed you to log onto your computer biometrically, right? And this is in 2006, right? Uh -huh. um, yeah. And uh, it also would put out uh, Zigbee signals for gate operation. It had like four wireless technologies in it. And you validated yourself to your own device. So there was no central database that your biometrics went to. So it, it made perfect sense um, in so many ways. But I think it'd be, it will realize this required a lot of change in how organizations did things. And there wasn't enough runway, mm -hmm. right? to wait that out. And um, so that uh, I uh, actually actually told the investors that, you know, it's going to take a lot longer than you think. And we made a tra transformation and I uh, hung out a shingle and did some uh, independent consulting. 
after that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think of, you know, you say it's ahead of its time. And you know, that takes mindset change, the way that people behave. It takes a behavioral change. Uh, even though it solves all these problems, makes it that much more secure, the value is there. It's a, it's a mindset and behavioral change that you just can't make happen. You can't yeah. force it. And I that think that that may, that may come into conversation here in a little bit as we keep going. Okay. Uh, yeah. But that was a lesson I took away from there that, you know, again, learning that this technology advances and, and changes, but if the technology requires a substantial um, social change, you have a totally different barrier um, that you're up against that might not be solvable or might be or certainly might require a different skill set. You know? So um, that I took that away. Okay. So valuable lesson, you know, uh, another, you know, extremely valuable lesson. I, we built a company and we did all that stuff, you know, had a commercial grade product and could ship it and support it and train it and all of those. But it didn't, uh, you know, we couldn't get the scale to happen. Um, right. And uh, that company, you know, went on in a smaller sense and sold their technology portfolio to others. And um, mm -hmm. so I, I'm out doing some consulting. I get a... Um, and again, contacts in the industry are what key people you've known and hopefully worked well with. And uh, I got a gig working for Constellation Energy um, on their uh, real-time demand response technology called VirtualWide. And uh, I was of interest to them because I understood the building side that they had to interact with. And we uh, designed out and then an engineering team implemented uh, connect, uh, you know, a whole system to issue real-time demand control signals out to mm -hmm. building operators, you know, before it had been a phone call, like, Tim, can we shut some loads off in your building? And you had to approve it. This now was a nice browser-based UI. You could accept or decline. They'd show you how much money you'd get if you accepted. Um, and uh, was a consultant there, and I brought in people, worked with worked with Arno Schulten. He was the other um, consultant with me designing this you know, the functional design of this solution and then uh, brought in Brian Frank to help us with the data modeling. And, you know, again, what is this? It's a project, right? Different yep. technology. I don't know all of this stuff. Tremendous learning about how energy is sold and traded and all of that um, type of thing and how the economics can work to offer building owners, you know, substantial payments for demand reduction which is a big part of the whole thing. And this was early days before ADR open, the ADR standard, the open ADR standard was just starting to formulate at that time. And we had to deliver working results in like nine months. So, yeah. And, you know, it goes, goes back to uh, residential solar or I'm sorry, the uh, alternate energy concepts, right? Yeah. Just, <laughs> you're, you're right. You're right back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just trying to gas up your hot rod, man. <laughs> yeah, right. We have to save it over here so we can use it over there. Um, yeah. But that was part-time consulting, and I tried to get some other consulting gigs, and I met some people from Cisco Systems. And uh, back in 2008 and 9, uh, 10, Cisco decided they were going to get into building automation. Acquired uh, Richard Zeta as a core, uh, invested a bunch of money into a group called the uh, Connected Buildings. Uh, and um, I tried to get a consulting gig and they refused me and told me instead they wanted to hire me. <laughs> and so I went to Cisco, you know, Silicon Valley, high flying, rapid growth networking company, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, IP phones changed the world with IP phones. Right. Yep. And and they expected to change the world of building automation. And um, I think they could have, but they had one other expectation, that it could happen quickly. Yeah. And it couldn't because yeah. it was, would require a fundamental change to how an entire industry and value chain worked, right? Yeah. Um, and so they didn't uh, uh, continue on with that initiative. I actually left before they decided not to continue on with it. I... Uh, got a call from uh, an old associate, Brian Frank. He said, hey, you know those ideas we put together on paper? 
I built the software and the phone's ringing. Why don't you come down here <laughs> yeah. and let's take this thing to market? And so that we we launched uh, Sky Foundry into the market uh, with just three of us back in uh, October 2010. 2010. And you've yeah. been doing that for the last 12, 12 years? 12 years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Longest run ever. Longest run ever. It's been fascinating. Okay, and so what's this? This is data analytics, a field I know zero about. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, but it's data analytics in the built environment and the systems and the operation of buildings and energy efficiency, all things I do. So yes. great. I'll learn about this data and analytics and all of that. And we'll go build a company and build distribution and build training and support and education and marketing and all of that. And, uh, you know, we were one of the early, not the only, but one of the early uh, proponents of, you know, we need to use data to improve the operations of buildings. Uh, and still wholeheartedly believe that uh, myself, and I know uh, you do, many other people in the, in the industry do. Analytics is certainly growing. Um, and this is kind of one of the things I was thinking about, you know, when you talked about um, that the biosecurity technology and it just being kind of ahead of its time. I think analytics in a lot of ways, I would say going back to 2010, probably uh, really ahead of its time. Cause even now it still feels like it's ahead of its time because there are some of these social and behavioral differences that have to take place. Yeah. And we start having those conversations and uh, you know, some people get it, some people don't. What do you think some of the biggest bottleneck is for adoption and, and for accepting those changes? Yeah, obviously a question, um, you know, I've wrestled with over the last 10 years. Um, you know, it goes to the culture of how buildings are designed, built and operated. Um, and, and I think a stark contrast to it is industrial processes, right? And I, you know, spent some of my time in manufacturing industrial. And, you know, here's the analogy I say, can you imagine going to, uh, to Apple and talking to them and saying, uh, you know, what's the, uh, what's the component costs for this? I don't know, you know, eh, 70, $75. Can you imagine? They'd know it down to the hundredth or maybe thousandths of a penny, right? right? Because yeah. why? And they'd know their failure rates exactly why, because that's what generates their money. And there's a very clear direct connection. Buildings, I think this goes back to earlier comment that the people who occupy them and run businesses in them, may not have any affinity or understanding what's behind the walls and ceilings. Right? The temperature's comfortable. I can do my work. The lights are on. Is there something else I'm supposed to worry about? Yeah, the, there is. The reason you're comfortable is because we're simultaneously heating and cooling. You know, yeah. the second largest expense you have is the energy in the building, and yet it isn't perceived and brought to C-suite um, notice adequately. Mm -hmm. um, because if it was, you know, people, people would be using data to make better decisions about what's going on in the buildings, what needs to be addressed, what money should be spent, right? It's the idea of moving to data-driven management of facilities, right? And it has been, um, you know, frustrating, interesting and frustrating and challenging to, you know, to help people understand how these tools can help them improve their bottom line and the comfort and safety of their occupants. But the connection is not as direct as you see in manufacturing. And I think people have trouble with that. And I also think the diversity of systems and diversity of people involved in decision-making about buildings is one of the other barriers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had building operators say, oh, so your software's gonna tell me something's broken. Yeah, absolutely. Because I know it's broken. Management won't give me the money to buy it. I don't need you. And, but interestingly, mm -hmm. we've found that they do. And yep. here's, here's how, you know, Tim, I'm gonna tell you, so you're my boss, you're a financial guy, pretty stingy with the money, you know? And I, hey, hey you gotta fix this, Tim. And what do you do? You no. tune me out. Yeah. Tune please. me out. <laughs> and now I go, uh, Tim, here's here's the printout. 
It's your problem now. I am showing yeah. you, irrefutable, that you're wasting money. Your decision is wasting money. I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. It actually gave operations people the tools they needed to communicate effectively with the financial side of their business in a way they understood. Mm -hmm. All right. And I had operators say, I show them your screens and now they give me the money. I've been telling them for two years. Yeah. yeah. You know, and they'd be frustrated about that. Right. Yeah. But it's how human beings minds work. Right. Yep. Now, you still got to get to the point you, you have enough data that you could show them something. Right. So it's not a panacea, yeah. but it's interesting how it affects this behavior problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can it communicate it to you so that it actually does become important to you, relevant to you? And in fact, you know, in a way, it's your problem now. Tim, right. What are you going to do about it? Right. Well, it's like you, you almost need to put uh, like in this system needs to output blank, you know, not blank checks, checks with no date and no name on it. And then you hand it to someone and it's like, here's $3,200 in savings. You can put your name on it right here. <laughs> and, all you, and then when you put the date, that's when I'm going to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. There you go. Done. Right. Yeah, yeah. Check printer. <laughs> it comes with a check printer. <laughs> yeah, run up and all you run into the complexity of how buildings are designed, built and operated. You know, it's easy to, you know, critique this like this, but it's not, it's very difficult to fix it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen situations where the software, you know, the analytics has shown all these issues and organizations don't have budget because of the way their financial operation is run. Right. right? Mm -hmm. You know how the, it, it, you've been in this industry a long time. Hey, if you can show them a two year payback, they're going to go for it. Remember that story? Mm -hmm. Right? And there's lots yeah. of things you can. What if you show them a one week payback, but it requires capital dollars and there's zero capital dollars available? Yeah. It's hard to believe that a one week payback will not be sellable, but it happens mm -hmm. day after day after day. Okay. Yeah. This is fundamentally um, the problem, right? Mm -hmm. The way financial analysis and accounting works for buildings is often provides a disincentive to make them run right. Um, this is more learning, right? I, I, you know, I didn't go to school to be a financial guy. So this is kind of shocking me as an engineer, right? Especially, I know that if it was an industrial process that was, you know, reducing the yield of the iPhones, it'd be fixed tonight. Right? Right. right. But yeah. You know, and these are the complexities that I think we are all up against in this industry to help move the building stock forward to a sustainable and more efficient future. We have to break through and change this decision making process. We can't just yell about it. The guy literally, their budget has no capital dollars. I can't buy a new air handler. Mm. Well, how are we going to change that? You got to be able to go back and, you know, budgets of the whole one year thing can be a huge trap. I can't go back to my boss and tell him there was something I didn't think of. It's not you didn't think of it. Nobody knew it until the data exposed it. Right. I right. still can't yeah. go back. Right. These, these are problems that the built environment has to get over. I think you see and you see examples where they are. Right. We see great examples of super intelligent buildings, well run organizations who are, you know, excelling at this. Obviously, there's lots of them, but I would say yeah. the mainstream of the market still isn't and hasn't figured out how to change the way they manage and financially evaluate their buildings. Well, and some of it, too, I've been doing a little bit of study on like power gradients within leadership. And when you have a high power gradient, you know, very uncomfortable to go and tell someone bad news, especially mm -hmm. if that could look bad on me because that the higher the power gradient, the worse the repercussion if I do something wrong is. The lower the power yeah. gradient, the more you can talk to each other and the easier it is to say, hey, I have this problem, we could fix it together and it's better for the whole company. And then it removes the disincentivization, disincentivization <laughs> uh, that, that the finance team can give or that your boss could give. And, yes. and that's where data is almost like the great equalizer where it says the data doesn't lie, You know, facts don't care about your feelings, this is how it is. Exactly. And so yeah. how can we work together to, you know, make it, make it better. And, and analytics is such a great tool and, you know, it's not nearly as difficult to implement as maybe some people may think. Absolutely. Um, true. John, I want to, I want to close our time with this. Um, mm -hmm. 
it's, it's, you know, just kind of a general conversation around leadership. You know, I look at this, uh, I look at your list here of all the things you've done and how you've been involved. And, you know, I see, um, you know, kind of <laughs> leading the way for fixing the energy problem before you, you're even out of college or then you get out of college and then you, you go and you're speaking to the uh, Energy Engineers Association and, and you start to get noticed and you're kind of stepping up and you're, you're making opportunities and you start leading groups and teams and then you're leading companies. Um, and now, I mean, you know, frankly, you know, with what you've been spending the last 12 years and you're leading an industry. So what are some leadership principles you feel like you've learned? Uh, and you, I guess, you know, it could be broad leadership or more um, tactical, you know, person to person. But, you know, when you think about leadership, you know, what does that what does that mean to you? Yeah, well, first of all, I didn't know this at the beginning. <laughs> A lot of learning. It, yeah. you, you know, how to collaborate, much like what you just talked about with that interesting thing about, you know, the power differential, right? How do you work with people? You, if, if you don't think the only way you're going to get there is to order someone around, you are not going to get very far. You might do that while you have the power differential, while they're afraid of losing their job or whatever. It has to be communicating the vision of the mission to get people to buy in to do it. To me, that's that's it. You get people to buy into a mission, they believe in it, then they do it. And you're going to run into bumps and problems, et cetera, but people will work through that, right, if they believe in the mission. So to me, that is that is probably number one. You know, you've got to have the communication capability to get people to join the mission and believe in the mission so that they'll do it. I think that's the most important thing there. Um, the other thing, maybe not related to specifically leadership, but I'd say career development. Uh, I would say the ability to absorb information. And here's the distinction I'd make going back to the kind of college you know, exam thing, right? And, and I've tried to impart this on, on younger engineers, right? Read everything you can about this topic, industry, equipment. I don't expect you to remember everything you read. What you're trying to do is absorb new information. You are not going to become an expert in pick it, but you're going to know enough about it that when you're on a project team, like, hey, wait a minute, I know something about that. I, oh, you know something about Because most of the people, no one on the project team knows everything, right? <laughs> right so yep. absorb, absorb, but not with the mentality that I have to memorize this or know everything about it. I think that really yeah. works against our young engineers. And you kind of come out of, well, in my day, come out of college with that mentality. You got to learn it, right? You don't, yep. you don't take a course unless you're going to get 100 on it. You don't know. Absorb stuff, right? Yeah. Absorb about these different things. I've heard other people talk about it, uh, you know, curiosity. Um, mm -hmm. But curiosity might take you to other places that have nothing to do with your job. Nothing wrong with yeah, that. No. But just it killed the be cat. willing to absorb, you know, about, yeah. about the technology and the problems. Because you let it sink in, it's going to get connected with something later, most likely. Yeah. You know, one of the best ways that I've found to absorb information, and again, we're not talking about memorizing it all, but no. it's to, to when I'm reading something, when I'm listening to something, um, is to listen in a way that I think I want to turn around. I want to teach this to someone later. And so what that then makes me do is, all right, well, I'm going to look at something. I'm going to think of it in terms of an outline. What if, what's the main framework? Remember the primary key kind of points around that framework because then that's what I'm going to go and I'm going to tell someone and contextualize it to them. And when you think of it in those terms, it's less about, well, I need to learn for my own benefit and memorize it all. And it's more, I need to learn for the benefit of others. And yes. even if I don't get it all right, I know where I got it from and I can, mm -hmm. and I can then make the recommendation for someone else. That, that, that's a great point, and it's an event, you know, a benefit I had. I was a trainer at Andover, and I did training in, in many of these others, and then spoke these. In. And yeah, if you if you gain enough understanding that you can impart it to somebody else, that doesn't mean you know everything about the topic, but you can help that person that you're talking to come up a higher level in their knowledge. And yeah, it's one of the best ways to to learn things. No question about it. Yeah.
Well, and then it's also just very rewarding on the other side of it when you know that you've helped someone else have a better understanding or better, mm -hmm. you know, maybe their lives or career track, whatever it is, you know, that's, yeah. uh, and that's what people have done for me. And that's what I hope I could do for other people. And John, by golly, that is what you have done for so many people. So from where I sit, I'm, I feel so fortunate to have this conversation and to hear your story. And I'm glad that, you know, we'll get to share this with other people. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, you know, I, I mentioned this yesterday. I talked about Monday Live and the surprise you got. And, you know, one of the comments that I made was, you know, I hope to have half the impact that you have had. Um, you know, if, if my Zoom call at the end of my career is like, you know, 20 minutes, then, you know, that's almost half of what yours was. And, uh, but no, I mean, in, in all honesty, I just want to thank you for, you know, being a leader and leading the way for so many of us. And, uh, and then more specifically, just for this conversation, you know, I, uh, I feel very, uh, grateful and to have selfishly asked for the last few <laughs> you know, of, of some of the last uh, hour hours of your, your time in this industry. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. And I'm really happy to do it. I mean, I, we talk a lot about how do you get young people in to the industry and, and, you know, our industry is opaque. It's hard to see what you'll get exposed to. I tell people this is one of the most fascinating industry. You look, it is never the same. Right. From month to month, year to year, there's always new learning. There's always places to excel. You're into software, you're into mechanics, you're into thermodynamics, you're into machine. I don't know what other industry could provide as wide a range of places to apply your skills and find places to excel. But I also realize it's hard for people to see that from the outside, you know. Um, yeah. So I'm happy to do these types of things and maybe, you know, we'll reach a few people that go, really? There's something there? Running buildings? Uh, maybe maybe we'll reach some people and, and bring the next, you know, great, you know, people in that will have similar impact, you know. Yeah, I completely agree. You're a building genius, sir. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure. Well, that wraps this episode of the Building Geniuses podcast, a production of KMC Controls. If you've enjoyed this conversation, I encourage you to subscribe and share. And if there's someone else that you'd like to see on this podcast, tag them in the comments or reach out to us and we'll tag them in the comments. And as always, we appreciate you listening. Until next time, learn something new, teach someone something and build your inner genius.